Please stop me if you've heard this joke. <laughs> a woman brings her duck in to see the veterinarian. The duck is very limp. The veterinarian puts the duck on the examination table, places his stethoscope up against the duck and listens and looks at the lady and said, I'm sorry to tell you, but your duck is dead. Who laughed at that? That wasn't the joke. She says, that can't be true. That can't be true. Cuddles, my duck cannot be dead. She said, isn't there something you can do? He said, no. She said, are you certain? Maybe he's in a coma. Maybe he's just asleep. She said, no. He's, he said, no, she, the duck is dead. And she said, don't you have some tests you can run? And so he said, all right. So he steps out, comes back in with a brown Labrador retriever. The Labrador leans up on his haunches and puts his paws up on the examination table and sniffs the duck from head to toe. Then looks at the veterinarian, shakes his head. <laughs> and so the vet calls for a cat. The cat comes in, jumps up on the table, sniffs the duck from head to toe, looks at the vet and says, meow, real sad. And says, so the vet looks at the lady and said, He's, that, that duck is 100% certifiably, absolutely dead. And so he turns and he begins entering into his computer some uh, entries and then he prints out a bill and hands it to the lady. The lady looks at the bill and she says, $200 for just, just to tell me my, my duck is dead? He said, well, if you had trusted me, in the beginning, that would have been $20. But then there were the lab results and the CAT scan. <laughs> Maybe we better pray. So thank you, Father, for letting us come together to think about how good you are to us for the blessings of belonging to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, you'd please forgive our speaker. His sins are many. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. We're working our way through the Bible, looking at some of the great promises of God. There's over 7,000 in the Bible. No way we can look at them all. But we're trying to whet our appetite to create our own list of those promises that mean a lot to us. And we also have a declaration that we make every time we open the scripture to look at yet another promise. You know how this works. Please sit up straight, put your shoulders back, fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Let's say it like we mean it. You ready? We are building our lives on the promises of God because his word is unbreakable. Our hope is unshakable. We do not stand on the problems of life or the pain in life. <clears throat> well, he vies for the bedside position, hoping to be the first voice you hear in the morning. He covets your waking thoughts, those pillow-born emotions. He awakens you with words of worry. He stirs you with thoughts of stress. If you dread the day before you even begin the day, you can be sure that Goliath has been standing by your bed. And he's just getting warmed up. He breathes down your neck as you eat your breakfast. He whispers in your ear as you walk out the door. He shadows your step. He reads your emails. He checks your calendar. He sticks to your hip. He talks more trash than basketball players in an inner city league. You ain't got what it takes. You're not worth anything. You come from a long line of losers. Fold your cards and leave the table. You ain't gonna win this one. These are the taunts of the giant Goliath. And if you let him, he'll turn your day into a modern day version of the Valley of Elah, taunting, teasing, boasting, echoing claims from one side of the valley to the other. Remember how Goliath misbehaved. For 40 days, morning and evening, 
the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. Goliath and the Philistines were the perpetual enemies of the Hebrew people. They were the bronze-aged version of the bullies of the valley. They were the troublemaking, joy-taking nemesis of God's people until the day that shepherd boy David showed up. Until the day that he arrived in the valley with the purpose of bringing lunch to his brothers. You know, David occupies a wonderful place in the Bible. More is written about him than any other person except Jesus Christ. More than 60 chapters tell us the story of David or reveal the words of David. Yet of all the stories and of all the words, none is more valuable or more precious than this simple promise that he stated when he went into battle with Goliath. He said, the battle is the Lord's. Could you use a reminder of this promise? I have a hunch. I'm speaking to somebody who right now is facing a Goliath. They still roam our world, don't they? These giants, debt, difficulty, disease, dialysis, discouragement. You just pick your own D. He's out there somewhere. These are supersized challenges that pilfer our sleep and liposuction our joy. They dominate our world. But I want to tell you something. They cannot dominate you because you know what David knew. You know that this battle you're facing is not yours to face. And this battle you think you have to fight is not yours to fight. It is the Lord's. And I want to encourage you to do what young shepherd boy David did. And that is pick up five stones. Five stones. You remember when David went into battle with Goliath. Before he went into battle, he went down to the creek side and he leaned down into the water and he selected five smooth stones and he placed them in his shepherd's pouch. Why five? Why five stones? Why not ten? Why not two? Well, I can't help but think that there are answers embedded in the story of David. Five lessons he can teach us. Maybe they represent the five stones that we each need to pick up. The first lesson has to do with your past. When you face your giant, it's important that you remember the victories of the past. Goliath jogged David's memory. The valley of Elah was deja vu. Everyone else quivered, but David remembered. God had given him strength before to face challenges before. And when he saw King Saul, here's what young David said. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Everybody else saw Goliath and retreated. David saw Goliath and thought, wait, I've faced something like this before. You see, a good memory will make a good hero, but a bad memory will make a wimp. For that reason, the Bible says, remember his marvelous works, which he has done. Catalog God's successes. You're facing a giant, but you've faced giants before. Has he not walked you through such challenges? Has he been faithful? Has he watched over you? Has he protected you? 
Hasn't he kept you from hunger? Hasn't he kept you from cold? The most valuable thing that you and I possess is a journal in which we just write down all of the ways that God has blessed us. And the most important way for you to look when you face your giant is to take a minute to look back and say, wait a second, God has been faithful to me. I could remember those times that he made roadkill out of my enemies. Write your worries in sand, but chisel yesterday's victories in stone. That's what David did. He, he reached for the stone of the past, and then he reached for the stone of prayer. It's important to take time for prayer. Before David went high to face Goliath, he went low to get prepared. Don't face your giants without going low, without humbling yourself, without spending time in prayer. Paul the Apostle wrote, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray long and pray hard. You see, prayer spawned David's successes. When you read about the life of David, whenever he was strong, he was praying. When he was weak, he wasn't. When his own men turned against him, he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. When, sol when, when Saul's soldiers tried to capture him, David turned toward God and he said, you've been my defense and my refuge all the day of my trouble. How do you survive a fugitive life in the caves? Well, David did it with prayers like this one. Be good to me, God. And now I've run to you for dear life. I'm hiding out under your wings until the hurricane blows over. I call out to high God, the God who holds me together. You see, when David soaked his mind in God, he stood. But when he didn't, he flopped. How much time do you think he spent in prayer the day that he seduced Bathsheba? How about his prayer time that morning when he gave the command to have his friend Uriah murdered? It's doubtful that he prayed. Mark well this promise. God will keep in perfect peace all who trust in God, all whose thoughts are fixed on God. You see, God promises not just peace, but perfect peace, undiluted, unspotted, unhindered peace. And to whom does he give this promise? Those whose minds are fixed on God. So forget occasional glances, forget once a week considerations, dismiss random ponderings, Peace is promised to the person who fixes thoughts and desires on the King of Kings. Are you needing peace? Then fix your thoughts on God. Invite God's help. Pick up the stone of prayer. And don't neglect this one. Make God's name your priority. Make God's name your priority. David's priority was not his comfort or his success. David's priority was the reputation or the name of God. David jealously guarded it. No one was going to defame his Lord and get by with it. David fought, and when he fought, he declared, I'm fighting so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. David saw Goliath as an opportunity for God to show off. David saw Goliath as an opportunity for God to show off. Did David know he would exit the battle alive? No. But he was willing to give his life to protect the reputation of his good God. What if you saw your giant in the same way? What if your giant is simply just an opportunity for God to flex his biceps? What if God is using your challenge as an opportunity to display his capacity and his ability? And rather than begrudge the presence of a giant, be grateful for the presence of the giant because this giant is your opportunity to be a servant of God and display God's goodness. We all want to show off God's blessings, but what if God uses burdens to demonstrate his faithfulness? 
And rather than begrudge the presence of a giant, what if you were to say, well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing Goliath into my world. I consider it a joy that you would allow this challenge to come into my life because this is an opportunity for people who, who, who don't know about you to see you and to see your faithfulness. What if you were to see your cancer as God's opportunity to flex his healing muscles or your sin as an opportunity for God to showcase his grace or your struggling marriage as an opportunity for God to billboard his power. When everybody else writes you off, God steps in. And when everybody else knows there were no other options, when there is a victory, they know that it is God who brings the option. See your struggle, not as God's mistake, but as God's canvas upon which he will paint his multicolored supremacy. So if you jealously guard the name of God, make that your priority, then you got stone number three. Stone number four has to do with your passion. Rekindle your passion. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it from his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down to the ground. So David ran not away from his giant, but he ran in the direction of his giant. What a scene that must have been. On one side of the battlefield, there's Saul and all of his armies. On the other side, there's the armies and followers of, of Goliath with their do-rags and their tattoos and their B.O. and their Harley motorcycles. <laughs> Nobody is betting on the boy. Everybody's betting on Goliath. Nobody's betting on a boy, not, not, not the brothers of David, not, not the king of David not the army of Saul. Nobody's betting on that spindly boy who's running nothing but a blur of knees and elbows as he runs. And then all of a sudden, David pulls out his sling and he reaches in and he pulls out one stone and he loads his sling. And the only sound is that shoo, shoo, shoo. And he releases the sling at just the right moment. And when he does, Goliath just lets out a laugh. It's such a foolish thought. He lets out a laugh and he throws back his head. And when he does, it reveals one unprotected square inch of space. And that's exactly where the stone went. You might say that David knew how to get ahead of his giant. <laughs> Down goes Goliath, face first. And David runs over and beheads him. And the story is over. And God is glorified. And the children of Israel are protected because David practiced passion. He ran in the direction of his giant. Please think about this. When was the last time you did the same? When was the last time you did the same? Most of us do pretty good running away from our giants, suppressing our giants, ducking from our giants. Others of us have mastered the art of just sitting and staring at our giants. We're paralyzed by our problems. We've been staring at our Goliath so long we know how many hairs he has on his chest. We can list our problems, we can recite our problems, we can complain about our problems, we can bellyache about our problems, we can be overwhelmed by our problems, but when was the last time you stood up and said, you're not getting me? In the name of God, I'm coming after you, depression. In the name of God, I'm coming after you, debt. In the name of God, I'm coming out of you, alcoholism. It may not fall, you may not fall the first time, but I'm gonna keep coming, I'm gonna keep coming. I'm going to keep coming because the battle is the Lord's. When was the last time you ran toward your problem instead of away from your problem? And what if your problem 
is an opportunity for God to display his strength working through you. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. That's why we look at this last stone, and that is the stone of persistence. David didn't think one rock would do. Maybe the real reason that David selected five stones is because he knew that Goliath had four behemoth relatives. One of them was named Ishbi Benob. Don't make fun of his name. He might get after you. He was a descendant of the giants, and his bronze spearhead weighed more than seven pounds. And then there was one named Saph who made the list. He was another descendant of the giants. And then there was the brother of Goliath of Gath. And the handle of his spear was as thick as a weaver's beam. And these three seem harmless compared to King Kong. There was a giant there in Gath with six fingers on his hands and six toes on his feet, 24 fingers and toes. He was another of those descended from Rapha. These four were descended from Rapha in Gath. So why did David quarry a quintet of stones? Maybe he was thinking that as soon as he took Goliath down, Goliath's four cousins would come running over the hill and he wanted to be able to reload. You know, sometimes one stone is not enough. Sometimes one prayer is not enough. Sometimes one season of counseling is insufficient. Sometimes one apology just won't do it. Sometimes one determination of resolve is inadequate. Most of the time, you just got to keep loading and keep loading and keep loading and keep loading and never, ever, ever give up. You've got to just keep swinging that sling. But at some point, by the power of God, with the strength of the almighty king of kings, that Goliath is going to come down. And I want you to receive that as the word from the Lord through this message. Because some of you are thinking that Goliath is never going to come down. You stand against that lie. Because God brings him down. You just keep swinging, keep loading, keep fighting keep trusting, keep running, and you're going to see a change. Those five stones, remember the past, remember to pray, keep God as your priority, engage passion, and enlist persistence. Because David did this, the Lord used David to bring down Goliath. And the same God who fought his battle is the same God who fights battles for us today. Just ask Maritza Harris. She has fast faced her share of giants, not in the hills of ancient Israel, but in the streets of modern-day Guatemala. And she's gone face to face with the giant of disease and death and sorrow. Her life has not been easy, but like young David, she's still standing. And like young David, she's trusting God to fight on her behalf. We came to know her through one of our short-term mission trips. She's here with us, and I want you to meet her. But before you meet her, turn your attention to the screen and take a look at her story. Mi nombre es Maritza Jerez. Nací en el municipio de Chichicastenango, en Guatemala. Y a la edad de 11 años fui diagnosticada con artritis crónica juvenil. No crecí en un hogar cristiano, pero mis padres hicieron un sacrificio financiero para matricularme en una escuela privada cristiana. Y como parte del plan de estudios, tuve que estudiar la Biblia en ese colegio. Ahí entregué mi vida al Señor. Y mi encuentro con Jesús fue la fuente de energía que necesitaba para enfrentar todo el dolor físico y emocional que vendría pronto. Después de graduarme, encontré un trabajo, pero solo duró unos meses. El cartílago de mi cadera se había desgastado lo suficiente como para ya no poder caminar. Pero en ese entonces...
madre era un ángel para mí. Ella fue mis brazos y mis piernas cuando ya no podía usarlos más. Unos años más tarde experimenté uno de los dolores más fuertes emocionales para cualquier ser humano. Mi madre falleció. Tres años más tarde mi padre falleció. Las dos personas que me amaron y me protegieron durante 27 años se habían ido. En el año 2008 las cosas comenzaron a cambiar, tuve mi primer reemplazo de cadera, estas son cirugías que mi situación financiera no me permite cubrir, pero gracias al trabajo de equipos misioneros que vienen a mi país, regularmente de Estados Unidos, que vienen por una o dos semanas, mi condición mejoró mucho. Sin mis padres decidí buscar un empleo, pero en ese momento todavía tenía miedo de salir a las calles y caminar porque tenía miedo a caerme y no poder levantarme. Preguntas como ¿qué pasará cuando se me caiga algo y no pueda recogerlo? ¿O cómo voy a lidiar con la mirada de las personas cuando me vean por la forma en que camino o la forma en que están mis manos ahora? Todos estos eran pensamientos que bombardeaban mi mente, sin embargo, Ahora hay una fuerza, había una fuerza siempre más fuerte en mi corazón. Recibí una oferta de trabajo con Missions Frontier, trabajando con los misioneros Matt y Leslie Capehart en apoyo a la iglesia local acá en Chichicastenango. He estado sirviendo a Dios a través de esta organización durante ocho años y ahora he llegado a ser la directora de esta organización. Desde entonces he sentido la necesidad de estar mejor preparada para el ministerio. Compartí mi sueño con el señor Capehart y él me dio todo su apoyo para estudiar en un seminario teológico en la ciudad de Guatemala. Cada fin de semana viajo tres horas hacia el seminario y tres horas de regreso a casa. Es un día muy largo, pero definitivamente ha valido la pena. Sobre todo esto he visto la fidelidad de Dios y cómo Él cuida de mí en situaciones como subir y bajar de los autobuses. Siempre he tenido personas que me ayudan a hacerlo. Ahora creo que puedo entender mejor al apóstol Pablo cuando dijo, por tanto, me gloriaré en mis debilidades para que repose sobre mí el poder de Cristo. A pesar de mis debilidades, Dios me permite hacer cosas que me sorprenden. Él hace posible lo imposible. Él hace todo de la nada. Y como padre amoroso he visto cómo me ha tomado de su mano y me ha llevado a cumplir todos esos deseos que él mismo ha puesto en mi corazón. Can I introduce you to our special guest, Maritza? We're so honored to have you with us. It's my privilege to be here tonight. It's a beautiful story. Tell us that you've faced many challenges in your life. What have you found to be the most reliable source of strength as you face your giants? Well, I think that just embracing him, embracing the Lord and his promises, um, I think that the Lord has been so faithful to me 
And I'm sorry, but I'm excited to be here. <laughs> <laughs> He's been good, hasn't he? He's been good to me. And I think that, um, you know, I know that if the battle if, is the Lord's, so I just need to embrace the victory that he has already given me through Christ. So I have, I know that, um, I have understood that if I just trust him, he will be there with me all the time. I have understood that it doesn't matter what I go through, this fallen world. That's all I need to know. That's all you need to know. Yes. That's a good word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray together. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for Maritza, for her example to us, for her message. We thank you for young shepherd David, who taught us much about trusting you and facing our giants. And now, Heavenly Father, we pray you'd give to us a spirit of resolve that we could face our giants with greater faith. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.